Good afternoon. I'm Abby Wolf, the Executive Director of the Hutchin Center for African and African American Research at Harvard. On behalf of Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. and all of us at the Hutchins Center, it is my honor to welcome Howard W. French this afternoon to discuss his recent book, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. Professor French will be joined in conversation by Daniel Ababoa. And here is the hefty tome, hefty in every sense of the word. It's a wonderful book. Um, a little one housekeeping note throughout the course of the discussion, please put questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A at the end. Now for the, the introductions of these two impressive individuals. Howard W. French is professor of journalism at Columbia Journalism School. He is a career foreign correspondent and global affairs writer and the author of four works of nonfiction and a work of documentary photography. He worked as a French English translator in Abidjan in the early, in Ivory Coast in the early 1980s, where he also taught English literature before undertaking a stellar career in journalism, which began as a freelance reporter for the Washington Post and other publications in West Africa. He joined the New York Times in 1986 and from 1990 to 2008, reported overseas as bureau chief for Central America and the Caribbean, West and Central Africa, Japan and the Koreas and China, where he was based in Shanghai. During this time, he was twice the recipient of an overseas press club award and his work has received numerous other awards. His other books include Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helps Shape, How the Past Helps Shape China's Push for Global Power, China's Second Continent, How a Million Migrants Are Building a New Empire in Africa, and A Continent for the Taking, The Tragedy and Hope of Africa. Like his current book, Born in Blackness, all three have been recognized by multiple outlets for their precise reportage and their historical depth. His documentary photography featured in his book, Disappearing Shanghai, photographs and poems of an intimate way of life has figured in solo and group exhibitions on three continents and has been acquired in both museums and private collections. He's the recipient of many honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Maryland. His writing is likely familiar to all of us from any number of leading newspapers and magazines, and he actually has a, a review in the current New York Review of Books. So we hope you'll read that if you haven't yet. Um, he also currently writes a weekly column at World Politics Review. And as if all that weren't enough, he also speaks French, Chinese, Spanish, and Japanese, and English, of course. Um, Next up, Daniel E. Abagoa is an assistant professor of African and African American studies at Harvard University. Before joining the Harvard faculty, he was assistant professor of conflict analysis and resolution at George Mason University's Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House. Professor Abuboa earned a PhD in international development from the University of Oxford and an MPhil in development studies from the University of Cambridge. His research and teaching focus on how state and non-state forms of order and authority interpenetrate and shape each other and the spatialization and materialization of mobility, power and politics in contemporary African cities. He's the author of not one, but two books published this year um, I think one, mobility, mobilization, and counterinsurgency, the roots of terror in an African context is I believe already out and coming in May is they eat our sweat, transport labor, corruption, and everyday survival in urban Nigeria. He's also the co-author and editor of other works on politics and the future of the African continent. And his work has been published in every leading journal in the field. He's the recipient of many honors, including the Harry Frank Guggenheim Distinguished Scholar Award, and he's also a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He serves on the editorial review board of the African Studies Review and also serves on the Z Africa Editorial Advisory Board for the series of Politics and Society in Urban Africa. Now, let me turn this over to Howard W. French, and thank you for being with us this afternoon. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for such a kind introduction, uh, Abby. And um, hello, Daniel. And uh, above all, uh, our, 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 our overlord and master, Skip Gates, who uh, has uh, um, convened us here today, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, I have a, a, a somewhat difficult task, although I give a lot of talks about this book. Um, I, we have a, a very tight time frame, uh, and the book has a very large time frame. Uh, the book covers 600 years of history, basically of the Atlantic world. Um, uh, and so I'm going to try to speak to a few essential points of the book, not pretending to cover all of the ground that it covers, nor to go into uh, any great uh, uh, amount of exhaustive detail and leave that for uh, Daniel Abiboa and myself to to, to, to get into more deeply uh, subsequently as we begin a conversation. I guess the first point that I, I make in Born in Blackness is, <clears throat> and I have a line to this effect in the very beginning of the book, that to, to, for a story to arrive at the right conclusions, one has to start in the right place. Uh, and so at a very fundamental level, this is a book about how badly we have rendered the story of the start of the modern age, how badly we have rendered alongside of that story, the story of the formation or the foundation of the West. Um, and I guess I should pause just um, momentarily to say what I mean by the, this term, the West. We often, it's invoked uh, countless times every day in newspaper and TV um, commentary, in ordinary conversations and the like, uh, without anyone really pausing to, to terribly often to, to, to assess what it really means or to even think about it. As I discuss the West in today's conversation, I mean um, a kind of condominium that forms in the 15th century, that begins to take shape in the 15th century between the Atlantic facing portions of Europe uh, and uh, the continental, or not just continental, because actually it begins in the, in the Caribbean, but um, uh, certain key portions of the so-called new world, uh, the continental new world, and especially the English speaking parts of the continental new world, sort of come to be the most, uh, the, the weightiest components in this hemisphere, but it didn't start out that way. Anyway, the typical conversations that we have and the way this is normally taught uh, in, in, I believe in public education, in grade school, in junior high school and high school, uh, says that um, in the 15th century, the Europeans and especially the Iberians were hell bent on finding a maritime route to Asia. Uh, and uh, in, their determination to reach Asia by sea, um, they saw Africa as um, essentially a, an obstacle, um, a, a, a barrier that needed to be circumnavigated and somehow overcome. Uh, and the technical uh, means of the Europeans in terms of nav navigation and sailing back then were very meager. And so this was the big challenge, how to get around Africa which if it is mentioned at all in standard textbooks or standard writings about this era, um, is only mentioned um, as uh, an obstacle, as an inert space, a place without any inherent interest of its own, a part of the world with no achievement, a part of the world with no ambition, a part of the world that doesn't figure in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> and so my book begins by challenging this very erroneous um, beginning to this conventional narrative that we have about the founding of the West and, the st and, and our, our arrival in modernity. And it says, it argues, it documents, in fact, because I believe these things are documented, how, in fact, uh, in the 14th century, meaning uh, well more than a century before Christopher Columbus arrives in uh, the so-called New World by sailing West, instead of by trying to circumnavigate Africa, um, uh, this process had begun through African agency. And the African agency in question was to be specific, um, the geopolitical ambition involved the geopolitical ambitions of the Mali empire in the early 14th century. At the very beginning of the 14th century, there was a ruler of Mali named Abu Bakr II, uh, who um, uh, we have strong reason to believe uh, had some conception of the, at least of the possibility of there being lands located on the far side of the Atlantic, and he conceived of a, of a, of a plan uh, to try to discover these lands. Uh, we know of, uh, uh, or at least we have accounts of, two voyages attempted uh, under Abu Bakr II's aegis. In the first of them, only one of the boats uh, returns, 
the captain of this boat reports uh, calamity at sea when the currents, when divergent currents or convergent currents arrived violently from different directions, north and south, and swallowed up the Malian boats. Uh, Abu Bakr II is not deterred, uh, and he says, we're going to keep trying, and in the next expedition, I am going to be at the helm. And so he ordered the construction of an even larger number of boats, and he sets out at sea, we are told, uh, and it's never to be seen again. Uh, so I'm not here to tell you that Abu Bakr arrived in the New World uh, or that he didn't arrive in the New World. Who knows? I think it's unlikely personally, but I want to speak on the basis of things we know. Uh, what we know is that Abu Bakr, the second successor, a man named Mansa Musa, traveled uh, in, on pilgrimage uh, 3,500 miles across the Sahara Desert with an enormous cortege, sometimes said to have included as many as 60,000 people in the year 1324, uh, and arrives in Cairo, uh, carrying 18 tons of gold, an amount of gold that had never been seen actually prior to this or hence in the possession or under the control of a single individual. And Mansa Musa begins to distribute this gold in acts of extraordinary patronage and religious devotion. He's giving it out to people high and low in Egypt and beyond. Uh, and in the end, the result of this is that the normal historical ratios that we see between the price of gold and silver almost everywhere in, in world history reverses. Gold plummets in value because of its uh, because of Mansa Musa's flooding the market. Uh, and becomes cheaper than silver. Okay, so I'm not going to continue on the Mansa Musa story, except to say that Mansa Musa gives the account to the Mamluk Empire, to the court of the Mamluk rulers in 1324, which is where we have this notion that his predecessor, Abu Bakr II, had tried to set off for some kind of new world. Of course, uh, um, uh, it would not have been called America or the Americas. It was just a notion that there were lands across the Western Sea. Um, uh, let me speak quickly to the geopolitical ambition that all of this speaks to and to my theory of it. My theory is that uh, this region of the Sahel, which is in the moment that I'm speaking of under the control of the Mali Empire, had for many centuries, even well prior to the Mali Empire, traded gold across the Sahara into Europe. Uh, and to for its major product, gold, to reach Europe, it had to travel, it had to transit through the hands of kingdoms that existed uh, in North Africa. Um, and these kingdoms, uh, acting as middlemen, did as middlemen typically do, and that is take big cuts. And so Abu Bakr II and his successor, in my view, both in their separate ways were seeking new outlets for Malian gold. Mali was the biggest single known source of gold in what in the proto-West, meaning the European and Mediterranean world, would have been considered the known world. There was no rival to Mali as a source of gold. And so because of its prodigious wealth in gold, the Malians were interested in cutting out the middlemen and finding new outlets for their gold. The first involved a venture to cross the ocean. The second, to bypass the North African kingdoms and, and begin initiate a trade in gold in uh, Egypt and through the, the Eastern Mediterranean. Okay, <clears throat> so to move on, the consequence of this historically speaking in the big scheme of things is that um, word of this extraordinary um, uh, display of wealth by Mansa Musa travels far and wide very quickly. Um, first of all, the price of gold is depressed in the Eastern Mediterranean for a decade or more, we are told. And then uh, not too long afterwards, uh, map makers in Europe become, they begin to busy themselves trying initially quite speculatively and in ill-informed Ill ways, trying to situate Mali on the, ma on, 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 on the maps of the day. Uh, this becomes more and more informed as the intensity of interest grows. Um, uh, some amount of intelligence is provided, uh, I believe, um, uh, by uh, Jewish traders who lived uh, in the Sahara re region on the southern, uh, on the northern fringes of the Sahara, I'm sorry, uh, who were allowed to trade in that part of North Africa because uh, they were people of the book, so to speak, and therefore um, their presence was tolerated by the Muslim rulers of these kingdoms. 
Um, and the maps begin to be more and more detailed and, and actually historically and geographically correct. This culminates in the creation um, in uh, the uh, late 1300s of a map that figures on the cover of my book, uh, the Catalan Atlas. I don't know if it can appear here with any clarity. It's one of the most important maps in the history of map making, I believe, and also one of the most beautiful maps in the history of map making. Mansa Musa appears in one panel at, at the very center of the panel, dominating the scene of West Africa, sitting in, in great splendor in the Sahel region, where in fact Mali is located on a pure gold throne, uh, hoisting a golden scepter in one hand and a solid gold orb in the other hand and receiving visitors who have come to pay him honors and seek trade. Um, this begins to set into motion the true beginnings of the creation of the West and of the, our arrival in modernity because of uh, events or um, realities which prevailed at this time in the Iberian Peninsula. Portugal, uh, in the moment we're speaking of, meaning in the late 1300s and early 1400s, was a very recently created kingdom under the Aviz dynasty. It had broken away from the constituent kingdoms that would later come together to form the nation of Spain. Uh, those kingdoms, those Spanish kingdoms coveted the reconquest or the resumption of their control over Portugal. And Portugal being very weak and poor had no evident means for its, to, for its own sustenance. Uh, its only economic products were salt, dried fish and cork meaning the materials we close wine bottles with. Um, and so the Portuguese, not having an outlet for trade onto the Mediterranean Sea like the Spanish, were particularly focused on the Atlantic. And having uh, learned of the, the legend, so to speak, of Mansa Musa, and having come uh, into possession of maps like the Catalan Atlas and other variants on this map which show Mansa Musa. There are quite a few maps which in this period which show Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire. The Portuguese make it their mission not to reach Asia, uh, which is the normal starting point of this narrative of modernity that we're familiar with, but instead to try to figure out a way by sea to connect with the prodigious amount of wealth in gold that is known to exist in West Africa. And this sets in, into motion a multi-decades quest in, whereby under the sort of auspices of a prince of the Aviz dynasty named Henry, who we know as Henry the Navigator, uh, a number of exploratory missions then begin to set out down the coast of West Africa. And they must overcome the limits of Portuguese and European navigational techniques, understanding of the sea and ocean currents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Finally, to, to fast forward a bit, in 1471, <clears throat> these efforts culminate in the arrival in what is present-day Ghana. And upon arriving on the coast of present-day Ghana, after many decades of pursuit of this dream of connecting with African wealth, not with Asian wealth, um, the, the, the Portuguese um, uh, discover, uh, uh, they, 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 um, they, they discover that even ordinary people, so to speak, even peasants in this, I'm going to use the word for convenience sake, Ghanaian society uh, adorned with jewelry. And so they know right at first blush that this must be a place uh, uh, that is um, uh, in possession of great amounts of wealth. And in fact, that quickly proves to be the case. The Portuguese established themselves there. Uh, they negotiate the construction of a fort, um, a fortified presence uh, on the coast of, of present-day Ghana at a place they came to know of as, know of as El Nina. I guess before I take that um, uh, uh, thread of narrative any further, I should say that the Spanish became quite incensed about this. The Spanish being much more powerful, much bigger nation with much more naval means at its disposal, looked on with envy at, the, at Portugal's um, breakthrough in discovering gold in West Africa and tried to take it away from them. Uh, in the 1470s, the Spanish uh, made several attempts to, to seize um, control of the West African gold trade away from the Portuguese uh, after, the Port after the Aviz had established this trade. Uh, and at one point even sent a major naval convoy down the coast of West Africa to impose itself uh, on 
on uh, this trade. And the Portuguese got wind of this and lay in ambush and managed to defeat the Spanish fleet uh, and subsequently to gain the blessing of the Vatican for Portuguese legitimacy, the sole legitimate, um, um, well, I should say the monopoly, the legitim a legitimate monopoly on trade with West Africa. Um, <clears throat> so um, the Spanish, a couple of things, I have to mention a couple of things with regard to the Spanish and then move on. The, the Spanish, um, like the Portuguese, have a theory that uh, if um, gold is available in such quantities in a place like West Africa, which is five, six, seven degrees north of the equator, then the distribution of gold in the world must be related to longitude. Um, and so, uh, I'm sorry, to latitude. And so the, the Spanish who had laughed Christopher Columbus out of court previously, when he presented himself with, a, with his plans to try to, his ambition of trying to discover a way to the to, to the east by going west. Uh, the Spanish reconsidered. They said, if there's gold available in the tropics like this, we don't care how foolhardy Christopher Columbus and his plans sound. If he goes, even if he goes west, if he's sort of loitering in the tropics, he's liable to discover gold. So, so we may as well f um, finance a few ships for him. This is the proximate origin of the Spanish decision to finance. Um, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and Columbus's first, and, and then, in fact, subsequent voyages. And so right away, we have here a, a major revision, and I think a, an accurate revision, about the way the forces are set into motion that lead to the creation of the West and to our arrival in modernity. The Portuguese also have this notion um, about the geographic distribution of gold. Uh, and instead of seeking rushing onward as the, mo the conventional narrative would have it uh, toward Asia, uh, which we are, have always been taught was the sole and unique focus of Portuguese maritime ambitions in this time, the Portuguese end up dwelling for three previously unexplained decades in intense engagement with Africa, which was all about a fascination with African social organization, with African political capacity, and above all with African material wealth. Uh, and so the Portuguese have their proof of concept in, in Elmina, in Ghana in 1471. And instead of rushing onward to Asia, they begin to explore the latitudes just to the north and south of the equator looking for gold. And this leads them to do many things which we don't have time to talk about today, but it leads them to the next big chapter in terms of the creation of the modern world. So big, in fact, that I'm going to argue to you that what the Portuguese did next um, involved the greatest economic innovation in the history of the modern age prior to industrial industrialization. And so what was this innovation? The Portuguese arrived not long after their discovery of the gold at Almina um, at, on uh, at the island of Sao Tome which is uh, almost exactly on the equator, just off of Central Africa. At the time, it was completely uninhabited. It's a volcanic island. It is heavily fed by seasonal rains. And because it's volcanic, it is in immensely fertile. The Portuguese had been experimenting with the, grow with the cultivation of sugarcane in the decade prior to this in places like Madeira and in Canary Islands. And some unknown per Portuguese person planted right away in this period, sugarcane in Sao Tome, and discovered that it was the perfect environment for the fructification of sugarcane. The only thing that was missing was human beings to farm the sugarcane. And we may end up getting into this in the conversation. I, I talk about this at length in my book, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this a little bit very quickly, only to say that sugarcane, first of all, refined sugar was, was one of the most precious traded goods in Europe in this time. It was unknown to ordinary people. Only the royals in Europe in the 15th century and early 16th century had access to sugar, to refined sugar. Only the richest people had sugar like this in their diets. And so sugar was an immensely profitable product. And, and therefore, this breakthrough in Sao Tome immediately holds great promise. And because we have seen everywhere throughout history in the long arc of sugar from New Guinea, where the, where the sugar cane plant is believed to have originated 
across Asia into the Mediterranean and finally to Iberia, uh, everywhere sugar had been produced, sugar had been associated deeply with forced labor or slavery of one kind or another. And that is because sugar has to be planted in a tropical environment in muddy, heavily moist soils and very densely. And sugar cane has sharp leaves that, that slice through the skin, in fact, as you rub up against them. And so in a tropical environment, muddy, water-filled um, uh, fields, densely packed with sugarcane, uh, the mortality rates for anyone involved in farming, not to mention just the ordinary insult of injury, is very high. Um, and so we have this combination of sugar and slavery or forced labor that has existed that had already existed deep back into time, and now in Sao Tome, the, the sort of the, um, the 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 new breakthrough, if you will, as horrible as it was, is made in associating the cultivation of sugar with yet one more thing, or actually a couple of more things. One of them is the highly regimented and specialized form of labor that we know of as the plantation, uh, and I'm going to speak to the. Uh, appropriateness of this term plantation, which slips, which falls so easily off of our tongues, um, but also with the association uh, with chattel slavery. Chattel slavery, slavery has been with humankind forever, we are often told. It has existed at some time or another almost everywhere. Uh, but in Sao Tome, we see a new institution of chattel slavery, which I want to define for you. As slavery, this is not a necessary ingredient, but in this first incarnation of sl chattel slavery, it was indeed an essential ingredient, and that is an association with race. From this moment in Sao Tome, for the first time, an unbreakable association is made in the minds of these Europeans between blackness and eligibility or appropriate induction, if you will, into slavery, into enslavement. And so that's one feature of this new chattel uh, institution that's formed on in the plantation environment. And the other uh, key um, uh, new feature is that as the name, as the word chattel implies, having the same root in Latin as cattle, um, chattel slavery, unlike almost every other form of slavery that's existed on a large scale in human history, uh, implied or, or led to the transmission of slavery across time down the generations. And so just like a cow or a horse having a foal or some kind of offspring, the, the owner would be expected to take ownership of the foal or offspring of that piece of cattle. So with chattel slavery uh, involving black people taken from Africa, continental Africa for the first time, this notion of, of an institutionalized slavery that is transmitted across the ages takes hold. Uh, and so here in Sao Tome, you have this killer app of the plantation using chattel slavery that takes shape in a nearly final form for the first time in human history. And this is the most decisive economic event I want to argue to you uh, of the modern age with the exception, the possible exception of the industrial revolution. And I'll have to come back to why there's this asterisk about possible as I conclude. So the Portuguese begin to grow sugar uh, at great profit on Sao Tome, which is a tiny little place. By geographic accident, almost immediately, they discover Brazil. Um, I'm sorry, I said geographic accident, I meant navigational accident. They're sailing, tacking down the African coast, not trying to get to Asia, but exploring Africa. And they hit the South American continent in the eastward bulge of Brazil uh, and discover a new continent quite by accident. By, the, by 1570, this new institution, okay, here we come with the word plantation. I'm proposing we think of it differently. I may slip and use the word plantation uh, and you all will probably continue to speak of plantations, but we need to think of plantations as prison industrial labor camps because these are people being regimented and worked under a quasi-military supervision using corporal punishment uh, to eke production out of them on a large scale. And so this is why I propose thinking of these places, this new work environment as a prison industrial labor camp. This model transits the Atlantic from Sao Tome where it's invented to Brazil by 1570, people brought from Africa have 
come to dominate entirely the production of sugar in Brazil. And then between 1570 and the early 1600s, 1630, 1640, thereabouts, what we see is the greatest um, uh, flurry of wealth creation in the new world in the early modern age. This is strange. This will be strange to most people's ears when you think about the stories that we have about the Western acquisition. Here I am using the word Western already, and this is, this is not an accident. We're seeing the beginnings of the West, this condominium between, East, between Atlantic facing Europe and the New World as an economic entity where they conjoin forces and they draw on each other, meaning the European populations living in both places. Um, uh, the most famous stories we have of wealth acquisition in this era don't involve plantations at all. They involve the feats of the conquistadors who uh, in small numbers showing incredible bravery, if you wish, um, sort of gallop into the territory of this or that very large and in fact, very sophisticated Native American kingdom, whether it's in Mexico or in South America, they conquer them against incredibly long odds, and then they acquire all of their wealth and precious metals. A special, so much metal that a special kind of ship needed to be designed for the transportation of these metals back across the Atlantic. That ship is called the Galleon. Um, uh, and uh, so these are very famous stories. Uh, and this indeed did produce a lot of wealth. The, the so-called Spanish golden century, which is how the Spain, Spanish themselves refer to this period, was a result of these conquests and of the carting off of these metals in the galleons across the Atlantic and eventually via trade uh, uh, with China across the Pacific. However, what I, I wish to impress upon you is that already by the early 1630s, the precise same time, this is the exact same era of the golden age of Spain, Portugal and the prison industrial labor camp system using relying on African labor, enslaved African labor, uh, based on a model, not just on chat, chattel, as I've said, but on a um, uh, intentional obsolescence, uh, meaning as we understand this from uh, our commercial lives uh, today, the de uh, designed obsolescence, meaning that African, the Africans brought to labor in these places were meant to be worn out. They were meant to be worked to death. There was no intention of husbanding their health or seeing to it that they could reproduce or, or, or investing in their welfare in any way. The design up front was that they would wear out in, in a, a known period of time, just like your iPhone or your automobile wears out. And so this nine, known period of time is very variously estimated to be five to seven years in the sugar growing world that is born uh, in places like Brazil and then migrates into the Caribbean, et cetera. Um, uh, but the point I was making is that this sugar, um, sorry, slave industrial, I'm sorry, prison industrial labor complex born in Sao Tome, transiting into Brazil in the late 1500s and early 1600s produces more wealth for Europeans than the gold and silver of the, the galleon trade, much more famous um, economic event. Um, in 1630, um, the English who are latecomers to this bonanza um, uh, occupy the island of Barbados, uh, which uh, had, had, had long ago been occupied by various native societies, but which they found barren, and they copied the techniques of the Portuguese. The English um, uh, on an island, one third the size of the city of Los Angeles in terms of a super, um, it's, um, I wanted to say superficie, which is the French word for surface area. Um, uh, uh, the, the English between 1630, the, when they established themselves there uh, and the end of that century, using the same prison industrial labor complex model, earn themselves again in turn as much or more profit than the Spanish had from their much more famous conquests uh, involving uh, the defeat of kingdoms and the, and the use of galleons. And this, 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 so this model having proven itself once time and again begins a, a, a sort of uh, continues its arc up the Caribbean. Uh, the English, in fact, uh, they don't understand, their, the British don't tend to understand their history this way, but this is, I argue, uh, the beginning of British English first and then British imperialism. This is what gives 
uh, whets the appetite of the English for empire and gives them the wherewithal actually to become a, a, a relevant expansionist power. They take on the Spanish in Jamaica. They defeat the Spanish in Jamaica. Um, Jamaica being much more uh, a much larger island with a similar climate and soil as Barbados then provides the, the English and subsequently the British with that much more wealth from sugar and from other tropical commodities used, grown using our model. And then um, uh, in the 1730s, the French then themselves get into this game in a very big way on the island of Saint-Domingue. Uh, I'm sorry, on the island of His Hispaniola in their colony we known as Saint-Domingue. Uh, and between 1730, when the French get their start in sugar, to the late 1700s, precisely the 1780s, this little, this portion of the little relatively small island of Hispaniola is accounting for perhaps a third of all of France's overseas trade. It's an extraordinary thing, bringing greater numbers of enslaved peoples than had been brought to any single place up until that point before, uh, and putting them into the fields using our model of chattel slavery and prison industrial labor camp um, working conditions. They extract, uh, they grind uh, this amount of wealth out of uh, uh, the population of enslaved Africans. In 1791, something uh, further, one other extraordinary thing happens. The, the, as this, I think many of my listeners can anticipate what I'm talking about. The African peoples of Hispaniola, of Saint Domingue in specific, rise up in rebellion. Uh, uh, and in succession, and I'm going to go quickly here in the interest of time, but in rapid succession, fairly rapid succession, they defeat the three great imperial armies of the era. They defeat first the French, the French being defeated, the Spanish decide, the Spanish controlled the other part of the island, that no, we're not gonna let these enslaved peoples go free. We want to control this wealth production. The Spanish tried to impose themselves, the Africans, and I'm calling them Africans deliberately because the life expectancy being only five years for people freshly arrived, no one had time to acculturate into another identity yet. People were very often still speaking their native languages, which meant, meant languages from many different parts of the African continent. The Africans defeat the Spanish. The Spanish being defeated, the British say, hey, we can't allow this incredible source of wealth. We were jealous when the French controlled it. This is our opportunity. The French sent the largest naval expedition, in, I'm sorry, the British in their history across the Atlantic in order to try to um, put down the slave revolt and take care, take control of commodity production in Saint-Domingue. The, the Africans defeated the British. Uh, by the way, more British died in that campaign, in that failed campaign, than died in the American Revolutionary War, a fact that few British people are aware of. And then yet one more astounding thing happens. The, the British being defeated, the French try again. Napoleon himself sends the largest naval expedition that the French had ever sent across the Atlantic in order to try yet again to defeat the enslaved peoples, and they won. And in the founding of their republic in 1804, um, the Haitians, as they called themselves, from the very their very founding constitution and document, they um, uh, that they put into place, they implement unlike any country in world history prior to that, the most important principle or ideal of the enlightenment. And that is the ideal that no person can enslave any other person and that people shall not be discriminated against each other on the basis of race or color. This is in the founding document of the Haitian Republic, something written by and on behalf of Africans brought together in this cauldron of the prison industrial labor camp system on the island of Hispaniola in the colony of San Domingue. So why is this important? I really have to conclude here to save some time for the, for, for the conversation. This is important, not just for the sort of feelings of pride that this can legitimately instill in uh, people of African descent who hear this story, but to help you understand how profoundly uh, these events shape the world we have to follow, we have to think carefully about the impact of each of these steps beginning in Sao Tome, one after, actually beginning in El Mino, one after another, we are seeing 
world history being shaped by Africans or by people of African descent in ways which have been totally unaccounted for in the conventional tellings of the history of modernity. And so I will finish with one last chapter. Uh, the Haitians do, as I've said, in defeating all of these imperial armies and in writing their constitution. And this sets in motion one last great set of world changing historical events. And that is Napoleon being being nearly bankrupted by his double failed bid, bid to control Haiti, sells all or part of what become 15 American states to the Thomas Jefferson administration. The size of the young United States doubles overnight. Uh, and because um, uh, the old plantocracy, the plantocracy of the old American South, which was dominant in the American economy and in American politics up until this point in time, takes fright. And they say, not only must we isolate Haiti and deny recognition to Haiti and impose indemnities on Haiti, but we must also thin out the ranks of the black people in the old South, because if they can, if people like this can defeat the great imperial armies of the age, then perhaps they can also defeat the plantocracy that controls the South and the political elite of the United States. And so under the Thomas Jefferson administration and then subsequent administrations, hundreds of thousands of people of African descent are deliberately marched across, marched is the right word, by foot across the breadth of the United States to the Mississippi Valley, where they are put under the production of cotton as enslaved peoples. Uh, using this model, which was born in Sao Tome, the prison industrial labor camp system. And yet one more extraordinary thing happens. In 1791 uh, or 1793 thereabouts, the first cotton of any quantity is registered as having been produced in the United States. It's just a few thousand pounds. Uh, by 1830 or eight, the eight, early 1830s, the United States is producing 36 million pounds of cotton. By the 1830s, it, cotton is already the leading economic export of the United States. By the eve of the Civil War, you need to hear this number, the United States is producing 2 billion pounds of cotton per year. All of this is the output of the people who, uh, of people who have been brought from Africa and their descendants across the Atlantic and put to work in this in economic innovation that I've called the prison industrial labor camp system, which utterly has, trans has created the West and has transformed its prospects and has made put the United States on the route of becoming a continental power and a preeminent economic force in the world. By the way, final word, uh, we are usually told of the um, uh, industrial revolution as a story of ingenuity in terms of industrial uh, organization and business um, planning and conception and some clever people who got the idea to innovate in the creation of looms and putting people workers together all under one roof and supervising them in one way or another and indeed there was ingenuity involved but there wasn't there would have there could have been no industrial revolution without the prison industrial labor camp revolution that we have been speaking about for this last hour uh, the primary ingredient, uh, the staple ingredient, the, the essential ingredient of the Industrial Revolution was slave-grown cotton from the United States. And the productivity, I, I mentioned the numbers, from almost no cotton to 36 million pounds of cotton to 2 billion pounds of cotton by the eve of the Civil War, the productivity of this world of enslavement in the Mississippi Valley grows almost in exact lockstep with the productivity of the Industrial Revolution, the, the English part of the Industrial Revolution. And these things must be, instead of being understood as separate things, they must be understood as codependent things and, uh, and uh, as coming about as the result of this phrase of, that I use in my title of Africa and of Africans and the making of the modern world. So uh, Daniel, I think I will stop there and uh, allow for some questions and conversation between us. Thank you. <laughs> Great, <Howard>. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Howard. It's 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 difficult to do justice to 
600 uh, year history, but uh, you've, you've managed to give us the chapters uh, are really helpful. So I just want to comment a little bit and then go into the questions, which I'm sure people are eager to ask. Um, so I think uh, Born in Blackness, in my view, is a, is a prime example of how to do the work of historical uh, deconstruction, how to read history uh, against itself. Uh, a grand sweep as we had of 600 years of history. I think you do a great job in reconfiguring the, the, the margins of the modern by upending the way Africa has been typically depicted in grand narratives uh, about the making of this modern world. This really is, is fundamentally a project, uh, in my view, to restore what has been erased rather than to instill uh, any kind of guilt, even though personally I think guilt can, can, be, can be helpful. Uh, born in Blackness goes beyond uh, the present and the presented uh, to bring to light uh, the unspeaking and the unspeakable. And hopefully, just hopefully, uh, Black, uh, Born in Blackness will help to put to rest the stubborn myth uh, of European uh, superiority. The history of Africans trying to cross the Atlantic, you argue so eloquently, uh, predicts um, that of Europeans uh, who are trying to cross the Atlantic. And the history of the Atlantic is one that is textured and is deeply interwoven. Um, while pivotal uh, Black scholars uh, before you, from Du Bois to uh, Carter Woodson and, 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 and Rodney King, uh, uh, come to mind as kindred spirits on this historical peregrination that you take us on, uh, in my view, uh, born in Blackness is, 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 is more emphatic and it's more unambiguous uh, in reclaiming and reconfiguring uh, the fact uh, of the modern. This is not just Rodney King writing about how, um, how um, Europe underdeveloped uh, Africa. You mean Walter uh, it, Rodney, uh, sorry. You, Walter you mean, Rodney, sorry. Yes. I'm, I'm making a confusion with the 1992 okay. death of it's the- an interesting, It's an interesting <laughs> confusion. Yes, yeah. So this is not Walter Rodney at 30 year old or so uh, talking about uh, how Europe underdeveloped uh, uh, Africa. Uh, I think you're far more ambitious, far hungrier, and certainly I think far older <laughs> to uh, Walter Rodney when he was writing that book. I think you, 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 your, your thesis is very clear that uh, the story born in blackness is a story of how Africa built the West. And it's really that simple, it's really that straightforward. Uh, this is not uh, trying to get a seat, a, a seat at the table of Western uh, modernity. <laughs> it's, it's turning the table on the, modern, on the modern as we know it. And so that's how I see sort of your position in light of, uh, in the shadow of these uh, major, major scholars. Uh, I think that the deconstructive story alters radically how we think write and teach about, uh, about, about Africa and Africans. Uh, and it certainly uh, would be on my uh, reading list for the core intro introduction to African studies that I teach later in the fall. And just to link this to say that your uh, thesis reinforces a, 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 a speech that was given by Chinua Achebe, the great Nigerian writer in the 1990s when he talked about in, in front of the World Bank telling them that Africa is people. That was the title of his talk, Africa is People. And he goes on to argue that we need to move towards what he calls a balance of stories. And I think that's what uh, I think about when I think about um, uh, uh, born, born in Blackness. Uh, you're not a typical, you're not a professional uh, historian. And I think there's an advantage in that, even though uh, you would have faced criticism about the stretch uh, uh, in terms of how you approach it. But I think. I, because precisely because you're not a professional historian, you are able to overcome the selective memory of the making of the modern uh, in Euro America, what, what Du Bois would call the propaganda uh, of history, a propaganda that obviously fills the pages of children's school books and masquerades as truth uh, in, in, in the academia. So it, it, it's accessible and it magic manages to, to seamlessly interweave the personal and the historical. And I can see you made a conscious attempt throughout the book to sprinkle it constantly uh, with, the pers with the personal. So, and that's where I want to begin from in terms of the, the question. Um, 
in the intro to your book, you give us a sense of the connection of your wife's uh, personal family history. And towards the end, you sort of move into your own personal family history. So I want to ask, could you bring to bring home to Ross uh, uh, a sense of the ties between uh, the personal and the historical uh, in the telling of, 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 of born in blackness. And by personal, I don't just mean family, but also career wise, in terms of being one of the foremost uh, 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 black members of the times at the time when only few black people can dream of taking such a senior position uh, in such an esteemed newspaper. So I think that's something that I would like to hear more about, about that connection between the personal uh, uh, and the historical in born, born in blackness. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so you said something that pleased me on the one hand, but also I ended up at another level sort of disagreeing with just a little bit. And that is that um, you, you noted with pleasure the way that I had sprinkled my narrative with personal stories and that this had kept things moving along and enlivened the, the book, I think. Um, and, and I did in fact try to do that. Um, but I didn't go out of my way to try to do that. That's where I come up with the slight difference, right? Um, I was impelled by my own life experience, by my family background, by the connection to Africa via my wife's background, um, and by my professional experience to do this book. Um, I almost, you know, I wrote a book about China and Africa um, uh, several years ago. Uh, and I feel similarly about this book as I did that book. At the time, there was this great discourse about what's China doing in Africa, and 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 few people who wrote about this knew anything knew knew more than one side of the equation. Some people knew China well but didn't know anything about Africa. Some people knew Africa well, didn't know anything about China. Some people didn't know either of them well and still wrote about it. Right, but I had spent many years working in Africa, writing about Africa, thinking about Africa, and I had also spent numerous years in China and spoke Chinese. And so I felt impelled. I wasn't, I didn't pick this out of my hat. I was like, okay, how could I not do a book on this topic, right? And so I, I, I don't mention that previous book just to, to puff myself up here. I felt impelled in the same way with this book. Um, I grew up in my household, uh, spending summers on land that was worked by enslaved ancestors who were the peers and political allies of our founding fathers who had had children by their property, their enslaved women in the same way that the Sally Hemings family story was produced. Uh, I Before the Sally Hemings thing had been validated, and this is an immensely important story, I mean to take nothing away from it, I grew up with this in my household. This was something I grew up hearing about as a child, knowing about from my from an early age, right? Uh, and so the notion of where we come from as an Americans and where I come from and where my family comes from as individuals and as a family and what this all means in the greater scheme of things was built into me. Um, then I moved to West Africa. I work in West Africa for several years. Uh, in, uh, the, in the um, uh, 1980s, uh, I marry a woman from, from Western Ghana. I didn't know at the time that her family was literally just from a few miles away from where this, all, this whole gold story begins. Um, but I did have a, um, a certain other inklings of the deep connections that, began, that, that, that existed between that part of the world and bigger currents in world history. And these are things that unfortunately, often you need to leave the United States to sort of begin to sense, right? And so this also helps to put me onto the path of this story. And then finally, um, uh, and, and I learned some of my wife's language and I became familiar with that part of Ghana and ultimately with pretty much all of West Africa. And so these things primed me for, 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 for thinking in, in a prolonged way, in a long-term way about these themes. Uh, and then there's the final thing about my, my career at the New York Times. You said, um, uh, um, you know, uh, correctly that, you know, we were, I'm the fourth African-American to actually have been a, in any true sense of the word, a foreign correspondent to the New York Times. Uh, that's not a lot of people, right? I'm the first foreign correspondent um, who in a long-term sense got off of what, in the State Department used to be called the Negro Circuit, 
right? The Negro circuit, when the State Department was finally obliged to hire African Americans, they had a circuit of black places that they, uh, you know, would confine people of African ancestry to to working in, right? Um, uh, and so, um, you know, this led me. Ironically, the first place they sent me could, to get to break me out of the track of sending my, all of my African American predecessors who were lucky to become foreign correspondents, all of them got sent to Africa. So they decided to do something novel with me, and they sent me to the Caribbean, um, which, which you know, I can't even tell. I've told this story a hundred times and can't still can't tell without chuckling, right? But it was fortuitous in 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 a sense because it also helps put me on the path of this story, you know. And I can speak some tree from Ghana, and I go to places like Suriname and Jamaica, where in the mountains of the Maroon communities there, in the forests of Suriname, I can I was able to actually communicate with people with bits and pieces of a living language from West Africa, and it's just you know these things affected me, and they become the glue and the kind of um, connective tissue uh, between lots of the ideas and the stories that I tell in my book. And so in the way that I spoke about in my previous book, I felt uh, compelled, but even more compelled uh, to take this on. The, ch the big challenge for me was ref really refers to something else you, you, you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and um, I, uh, you know, I don't have any discomfort in acknowledging I'm not a scholarly historian. I don't have a, a background in academic history. Um, uh, and so to take on a book that tries to treat history seriously without that kind of background involves either a degree of foolishness or a degree of trepidation. And for me, um, hopefully it was mostly the latter. And it made me work very hard and to spend a lot of time in the archives and to do an enormous amount of reading and to have lots of conversations with scholars. Uh, and to think very hard about my arguments. And I don't say any of this to pretend that I have the last word about any particular business uh, of the 1600, 600 years of history that I tell. That's not the way history works. Nobody has the last word in the, the relating of history, but I do think it allowed me to see things uh, freshly uh, and with a bigger picture kind of perspective than most academic historians most of the time feel comfortable with. I think Skip wanted to come in. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, Howard, fascinating. <clears throat> I can't wait to read the book. I love um, I love your work, as you know. Howard, full disclosure, is an old friend and person I admire very, very much. Uh, Daniel's point was that uh, you, you, the, the import of your your work is is twofold. It's a work of synthesis of um, scholarly work that has uh, been in the canon for a long time. Like the, the sure. stories that you told in your summary are twice told tales. The scholars know these mm -hmm. stories, but the general public does not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're a journalist and you're, a, and, and I don't make a distinction between the best j journalists and the best scholars. I mean, it's just a different kind of writing. And your gift among one of many, your fluidity, fluidity of language is also um, um, the additional gift complementary is synthesis. You can tell a good story. You can take uh, lots of scholarly tomes and then put it in a 600 year history that is fluid. And, and, and that's to me the greatest compliment that I could give uh, anyone. It's like New Yorker writing, you know, New Yorker view books writing. Um, to me, that's the best writing that, that, uh, that, that there is. I think and this is leading to a comment and a, and a question. So far, your original contribution is um, to coin the phrase prison industrial labor camp, which does a whole lot of useful uh, economic work and, and cultural work. And I commend you um, um, for that. And also um, pointing out that the, the, the growth of uh, imperialism, capitalism, plantation economy, all inextricably intertwined. And the British might not want to trace their roots of the empire to Barbados, but that's where it is. And there ain't nothing right. they could, ain't nothing they can do about it. The, oh, the cotton gin, by the way, is 1693. So you got that. <laughs> um, but my question is, and the reason I value your work um, in, in um, African studies so, so much is this, how 
do we get the story? I mean, you, you, Mansa, everybody knows the story of Mansa Musa. I've, there've been a hundred documentaries that mentioned Mansa Musa. I've mentioned him three times in documentary. Mm -hmm. the, if you Google right now, who's the richest man in the history of the world is Mansa Musa, networth.com, right? But we have to keep telling these stories it's like Sisyphus, man. We have to keep telling these stories over and over and over again. So my question is, how do we naturalize the story of black people in the world? And by naturalize, I mean in the same way that we got to first grade, uh, this is gonna sound far afield, ladies and gentlemen, but I got the first grade, first thing I got, I was taught, my country tis of these sweet land of liberty. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag. My, God bless America. Why do I um, um, cite that? Because I also learned George Washington never told a lie. George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. Um, then um, what I want is part of that naturalization process. But by that, I mean, that's where we learn to become citizens in our public school, right? I want them to know the story of Mansa Musa. I want mm -hmm. them to know about the kingdom of Preston John. I want them to know that that letter appeared in Europe in 1165 and drove Europeans crazy because they were trying to defeat the Moors and take over Jerusalem. And that the richest man in the world was not Mansa Musa, it was the, the, the ostensible king of Ethiopia. I want, to know, I want them to know that when Ponce de Leon, as I was taught, came to Florida looking for the Fountain of Youth, he was looking for Preston John's Fountain of Youth. Mm -hmm. He wasn't looking for something in the new world. He just got lost. <laughs> How do we naturalize these stories, Howard and Daniel? How do we keep having to tell the story, reinvent the damn wheel over and over and over again? Howard well, and I don't, think we'll, I don't think we'll ever and stop having to do it but we may not need to do it as much uh if or with such insistence or with the the blood vessels bursting in our necks quite as much if we can achieve a few things and i've tried to do some of those things in this book and i don't I say what i'm about to say because i pretend like my book no one book is going to do what you're calling for um i've tried to make contribution to this um but uh, I would start with the Mansa Musa story. So you're right. Mansa Musa has become well enough known that he has entered into kind of the popular culture. Like people who, you know, I watched by coincidence um, a couple of nights ago, um, they replayed the um, uh, um, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman fight documentary uh, on public television when we were kings. Uh, and it opens with a Spike Lee quote, which said something to the effect of when I was a kid, if you ever suggested that somebody black had some uh, meaning American had something to do with Africa, you better be ready to fight. Right. Um, well, we've come a long way from that time. Right. Uh, and so in the popular culture already, there's an awareness of a guy called Mansa Musa as being possibly, probably the richest guy in the world, right, in the history of the world. What there isn't an awareness of yet is where I took that story. I'm not saying scholars, some scholars haven't thought about this or even written about this, but I don't think people have really put together the idea that it was this African agency. It wasn't just the fact that he was rich. It was agency on the part of Africans that was Change that was responsible for changing gigantic historic dynamics and setting all kinds of things into motion that wouldn't have taken place, certainly not when they took place, had it not been for that African agency. This is a new thing in terms of public understanding. And so not just the fact of Amansa Musa or the amount of wealth that he possessed, it's how deeply he affected the currents of world history. And I, I don't think we've, you know, I've tried to help make this idea penetrate, but it's in getting things like that to penetrate, again, to repeat myself, the consciousness, I think we get over some of this incessant re repetition of the bare sort of beginnings of the story. And the other thing involves a little less obvious agency, but is similar, right? Um, the argument that I make, and you're right, I'm making a synthesis, especially in terms of this argument, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, African-derived wealth, meaning the wealth stolen from the labor of Africans, created the West and the wealth of the West, put the West on a path of divergence with the parts of the world that had for centuries previously dominated in terms of wealth and power, right? Um, it, we need to make clear uh, just how um, 
uh, important this was, right? Uh, there's a scholar, um, uh, Robin Blackburn, who's quoted in my book, who has tried to do some math and come up with, and this is just one of uh, an endless number of possible estimates, but he's actually put up a number on it. He's saying that 2 billion man hours of labor were stolen from people put to work on plantations. Uh, that's a way of helping you understand, okay, so where, where, where else might you have come up with that kind of output or productivity, right? Uh, if you think that you, you, you know, Westerners are so great and that Judeo-Christian this or Protestant work ethic that or, or uh, the Enlightenment this or whatnot, it's responsible for everything that makes, has made for their success. How do you, where would you have been without that, right? Uh, another astounding fact, you know, prior to 1820, four times more people were brought across the Atlantic from Africa than from Europe. Who do you think made the West? Who do you think made this project viable? Most people don't know these kind of things. And so it's, 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 it's sort of going beyond the presentation of facts and making deeper connections in ways that I think are irrefutable. That number is irrefutable. You can't dispute that number, right? The 2 billion man hours number you can debate, but it was a hell of a lot of man hours, right? We're talking, it's not different in an order of magnitude, right? That's not debatable, right? And so it's making these connections in a deeper way and with persistence that I think we'll get somewhere. Yeah. No, absolutely, and I agree with you. I think um, Skip's question is an important one, and you're talking about African agency and the fact that we learn about Abu Bakr II's um, maritime pilgrimage through Mansa Musa. Yeah. Right, uh, right, through his trip, this sort of ostentious and uh, profligate trip to, to Cairo and Mecca. And he gives us this gem of a paragraph through which we know that that happened. Uh, and one can only imagine how much knowledge uh, um, has been lost. And you, you, you agonized about the frustration with going to Jenne and to going to Barbados and to going to all these places and just not, and standing in the sight of a major historical happening and there's no trace, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. It's been effaced. Uh, and that's what's happening in Lagos, where, where, where I'm from. I mean, uh, where the Portuguese were before the British. You're having these buildings and structures built by uh, returnee freed slaves from Brazil pulled down uh, mm -hmm. uh, to mount, you know, for commercial interest. Uh, and that's happening. And, 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 and which was the question I wanted to ask you, but I don't think uh, we have the time. But it's just something that I've thought about, about why is there sort of a reluctance, even an impediousness uh, to sort of commemorate uh, these, these spaces by even Africans uh, I, at home. Yeah. Re respecting the time limits, I, I do want to touch on this, uh, Daniel. Um, and I want to return to the Spike Lee quote that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Um, the biggest next breakthrough in this whole domain is, I believe, will come out of knocking down the mental barriers that exist between Africans and African-Americans. We are still siloed. We are still very separate. Even though we've come a lot of long ways from what Spike Lee denounced as you know, how things were in his childhood and my childhood, and I'm pretty sure Skip's childhood, right? Um, we still have a long ways to go, right? Uh, and and, and th there's work to be done on both sides of the Atlantic, right? Uh, and Nigeria, Nigeria, my God, Nigeria. Nigeria is a cultural superpower that is sitting there basically not lifting its finger, right? I mean, I'm, I'm writing on this at present, actually. Na you know, Nigeria has make, has, makes no effort. It's the, it's the leading place for Black people in the world. Uh, and acts like it doesn't know that, right? Um, and this is a huge loss to everybody of African descent. And so we, meaning Amer African Americans on this side of the pond have to do what we can to draw these connections and to restore these stories and to help revive these monuments or situate these places of memory. And you on the, you're, you're on this side of the pond right now, but people on from the other side of the pond have their labor to do 
as well. And this is going to be like the building of the railroads in the United States. There's going to have to proceed from opposite directions and meet somewhere. And it's only keep, when the sorry. we're going to keep Daniel. We're going to keep Daniel on this side of the pond too. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't going back. No, but you're absolutely right. At our family reunion, man, we used to the Coleman family reunion, my mother's reunion. We used to give the I ain't left nothing in Africa award. You know, right. <laughs> because. We got our ideas of Africa from Tarzan movies, just like white people did. Absolutely. Um, but that's but that's changed. Abby, don't we have some questions in the queue? We do have some questions in the queue. We also have a lot of praise in the queue. Um, gratitude. We're going to go till five thirty. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm okay. ready for that. Um, a lot of gratitude for what people are calling your eye-opening work. Um, an adjunct professor says that she that she's going to use this your book for a survey course um, because it situates Africans in such an important Africa and Africans in such an important way. Um, one question came in that I think follows really beautifully on your comment, Daniel, just now um, about African technologies. Um, Ari Jacobov Jac Jacobovitz says, when thinking of how enslaved labor built the American economy, we default to examples of brutal physical labor. But the Africans that came to the new world through the Middle Passage had lives of their own before they were captured. They had skills that were developed in Africa. They had intellectual abilities that developed in Africa. How were these skills utilized and implemented in the new world by their captors? What can we say about the African technologies that built the American economy? Is this for me? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Or anyone um, who wants to answer, but yes. So, so this begins right from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. When the British, just what the, they were still the English when they took over Barbados and decided that they wanted to emulate the Portuguese and create a sugar uh, economy, they went to Brazil and they hired a, a couple of Dutch people to show them the techniques. And they insisted that the Dutch sell them uh, enslaved Africans who were expert in the production of sugar. They, it wasn't enough to have the Dutch. Um, uh, and the Africans in Brazil in this area in this time were actually operating in highly specialized roles. And even though refined sugar production wasn't something native to African, the, the, the expertise and the management skills were, were, had been taken over by the Africans already at this stage. And so right away, even in the transmission of sugar up the, up the Caribbean, you see this. In Georgia and in South Carolina, the production of rice early in the American colonial period draws heavily on uh, West African irrigation techniques and rice farming techniques in places like Sierra Leone and Guinea. The, 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 the slave, uh, the plantation, um, plantation owners in, in South Carolina and Georgia recognized the expertise right away. In fact, the Africans were teaching them things they didn't know about how to manage the soils, how to irrigate, and how to, uh, to achieve uh, maximal productivity in the growing of rice. You see this over and over and over in the new world. Time and again, it's just been written out of the accounts. We are led to believe that economic process, progress is something to be associated with whiteness uh, and that everybody else, in, if to the extent anyone else was involved, it was as a bit player or as just brute force. Uh, and that's not the case. It was never the case. Mm -hmm. Daniel, did you want to respond to that question? That's a no, just to say that even beyond technology, I mean, when Skip wrote his signifying uh, um, uh, uh, monkey, I mean, he talked about the character of Ishu, for example, of the Yoruba uh, people. And we know that that has also made it to in Brazil and in, like, in Haiti and across the world as well. So if you look even beyond technology, there is a gift of religion. That the, these were walking religion that was happening. And technology is important, but we have to also situate it and embed it in broader society. Uh, and that was that was that was very significant. Something they carried with them. There was no distinction between the religion and their their lived reality, and something that sustained them. Not to yeah. mention the drum, the banjo, uh, tapping feet, and shaking heads. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, you the go. African. It was a big myth in the the body of um, of African American um, culture and a big debate in the larger body of American anthropological and sociological scholarship. Uh, and many African-Americans um, argued, uh, the debate was whether 
there were, uh, whether Afro-American people, as we would say today, were sui generis, mm -hmm. or were we really Africans in the new world, as it were. And you know the mm -hmm. huge debate uh, that um, um, Melville Herskovitz um, uh, had with, um, um, oh, you know, nice. the great, no, yeah, with him, but also with, um, um, not Kenneth Clark, um, who wrote Black Bourgeoisie? Um, oh, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the Abby Google. I, um, I am, I should know, I'm sorry. Oh, E. Franklin Fraser. Yeah, thank Fraser. you. E. Franklin <laughs> Fraser. There were lo lots of African-Americans who argued that the middle passage had just erased, like, erased it, created the tabula yeah. rasa, which is ridiculous. Right. You know, like a two month- And, and obviously period. ridiculous. Obviously ridiculous, right? And so here's this white man, Melba Herskovitz is beating up on these black Americans saying, no, you're African. That is, I teach this, Howard, in right. Intro to Afro. And I say, that's just an example of what Spike's uh, epigraph uh, signifies. Right. That they just didn't want to be associated with Africa because they believed in the stereotype, they believed the stereotypes about Africa. Right. Uh, and it, it's shameful, but it's true. But there's one more reason why they didn't want to believe. It's because the dominant culture here has punished people for associations with things that might be seen as Africanisms, right? And so you saw this around the whole debate about Ebonics, right? Which we don't hear that term very much anymore, but you know, you get punished for having, literally punished economically speaking, for having a speech pattern that is unique to your culture as an African-American. You get punished for having a name which may or may not be truly African in its origin, but has a sort of African kind of sound to it, right? You get punished for that. Um, and so it wasn't just a question of shame, which certainly existed uh, for some people at some levels, but there were other incentives to distance yourself, deliberately imposed incentives to distance yourself. I had a question. Um... This is kind of my question because I've followed your writing, I will admit, in the New York Times when I was a graduate student and I would read cover to cover because I actually read it on paper because I it was so long ago. Um, but I'm really, I'm curious and I think a lot of people are about, you talked a bit about how your family background um, mm -hmm. brought you to this work, but I'm wondering also how your journalistic background, your work as a foreign correspondent brought you to the point of this book, because obviously your other books have been about African economy and especially about the role of Africans in China and the relations between the African continent and China. So if you could talk a bit about that, um, I think a lot of people would really um, like to hear how you got, how that work, your, you know, as a foreign correspondent par excellence brought you to this, this historical sure. narrative. Sure. Um, my, so my family moved to West Africa when I, just as I was entering college, uh, and I had four siblings, younger siblings, who had the great advantage, as I saw it, of moving with my parents to West Africa and entering school in West Africa, this was like an incredible adventure that I was missing out on. Most people see it going off to college as being an adventure. And I thought I'm losing, like they're going to West Africa, I'm going to Western Massachusetts uh, and it just doesn't seem fair, right? And so I really invested myself starting on, you know, the major vacations, visiting home, the new home uh, in Abidjan, in Ivory Coast at the time, to to catch up uh, and to be as good as my siblings were in French and to and to just plunge into the experience of West Africa and I traveled really widely. I had no notion of becoming a journalist yet, uh, and I began to travel. And you know, I've always been a big reader and uh, photographer, and just was enthralled by my experiences and. This kind of set me onto the path of very accidental path of becoming a journalist. I just, I love to read. I had always loved to write, but never thought of journalism and put, and now I'm traveling a lot and putting those things together. I just began to write a little bit in a genre that I didn't even think of in the beginning as journalism, but looking back clearly it was journalism. And, and this kind of grabbed hold of me and achieved a momentum of its own to, to the point where you know, journalism had declared me a journalist uh, as much as I declared myself a journalist. And so I didn't really look back from that. But subsequently, you know, I talked about the times and its history, it's, you know, of paltry hiring of people of African American descent in my professional lifespan, right? And, uh, um, uh, and 
and this played its own ironic role in all of this. I told my answer to a previous question from Skip was, you know, they tip the, the three people before me all got sent to Africa and that was the end, right? I got sent, I told them I don't want to go to Africa, not because I didn't want to go to Africa, because but because I wanted didn't want to be confined and because I wanted to. I'm a very young guy and I don't know how many chances I'm going to get for a foreign assignment and I want to see the world. And so they sent me to the Caribbean and then they expanded it to include also Central America. And so I became fluent in Spanish and I found myself just wandering the world of my book, this book mm -hmm. uh, back then. And, you know, superimposing things that I was experiencing in the Caribbean and Central America and ultimately in the northern tier of South America as well on my experiences in Africa and kind of making these connections. These are, this is the, the amount of accident involved in this is just, it's, it's incredible. It's like none of this was with prior knowledge, planning or foresight. It was, it was an accidental path. Um, and then the Times, believe it or not, sent me, and I chuckle about this all the time too, sent me where? Sent me back to Africa, right? So they had only sent anybody to Af of African-American background to Africa in the past. They sent me to the Caribbean. When I got done with that, they sent me back to Africa, right? <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'm going to have to make as much as, my, you know, who knows what else I'll get to do in my life, but I'm going to make as much of this as I can. And so I did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, subsequently, after that, the other opportunities uh, were presented to me. I, I made my way to East Asia. And in, in a very strange way, it's not part of your question, but I have to insist on saying this. In a very strange way, East Asia made me see this book. Mm. Uh, my last book was prior to this was a book about East Asia, Chinese history, basically. Uh, and I began to do a number of things. One of them is I'm reading your early European accounts of exploration to Asia. And I came across contemporaneous Portuguese 15th century accounts of exploration in Africa that I had never heard of before. And I think I'm a pretty well-read person and I'm a very well-traveled person. I just never seen this stuff before. Wait, the story has always been the Portuguese were trying to get around Africa. Here they are spending three decades in Africa and all these things are happening. That's where this book was born. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I got to finish the China book, but I got to come back to this book right after that. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what put me here. The other thing finally that happened in East Asia is East Asians all the time, even up till this present moment I'm speaking, are having these conversations about what happened that ended our period of ascendancy in the world. We were always, the, in their view, we were always the oldest, greatest peoples. We've got the longest pedigree of continuous civilization, these great empires, you know, um, incredibly long cultures, uh, periods of cultural achievement and writing and, and, and documentation and things like that. The, you know, they, in the cruder moments, they say things like when Europeans were wandering around with animal skins on for clothing, we were, we were like very, already very highly cultivated, right? Um, I, in, in East Asia, in Japan, in China, in South Korea, I'm hearing this stuff all the time. And, and it just kind of, it served as a kind of enzyme or catalyst to say, okay, how do I deal with this story of how did the West actually do this? And it made me put together all of the various things that I've been talking about and to try to come up with a synthetic account of this. And that, so that's, that's, that's why we're here today. That was exactly the question that I was asking, actually, because, um, yeah, just to know how, especially your um, Asian work informed this um, and what what view it gave you to the world, you know, not again, not only of modern economies, but of of the past. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I don't know. Daniel, do you want to ask another? Yes, I, know uh, you I, do, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I do have. Um, so. I want to give uh, Howard uh, a chance to respond to perhaps uh, um, a criticism that you may have encountered, uh, um, which is that um, people, some would argue that as you paint the picture of Abu Bakr II and Mansa Munsa, you also paint a picture of uh, these Malian emperors who had slaves. Mm. Um, and, and people would say, yeah, but we didn't start, uh, you, you will get people would argue and say, we didn't start slavery. 
that's we from um, uh, uh, the, the English speaking side of American Western Europe. Uh, the Africans had slaves. Can you make an important intervention in that? In how, how do you respond uh, to such an equivalence that is drawn uh, between what is happening here and what is happening, uh, uh, what happened as you painted in Chateau's slave? Sure. Um, so this I, this comes up in every literally every talk that I give, um, <clears throat> and sometimes it comes across in a to very healthy and positive spirit, such as I heard in your framing of the question, and sometimes it comes across in a in a rather different spirit, um, like ha ha, you think you're so smart, you know, you, you, everyone knows, or if you bo had bothered to try to figure it out, black people were selling the slaves, so how do you respond to that, right? Um, it's actually pretty easy to respond to. I guess the first thing I want to say is I wouldn't want to be, if I have a choice, and if you're enslaved, almost by definition, you didn't have a choice. But if I have a choice, I don't want to be enslaved under any circumstances, right? In any period of time in history. Okay, so let's just put that out there, right? Um, however, African slavery, as it is commonly known to have existed in Sub-Saharan Africa across the ages, was different in profoundly... Um, uh, it was profoundly different in categorical ways to the thing I described as the emergence of chattel slavery in Sao Tome and subsequently. It was a completely different institution. It was not, generally speaking, almost ever on a large scale generational slavery. It was not conducted on a racial basis. Uh, it was usually not even conducted on an ethnic basis. Uh, ethnicities were not fixed in the way that we tend to superficially see them as being fixed in the African landscape today, uh, back then. They were much more fluid, right? Slavery tended, I'm going to use a kind of crude general description, but I think it, it pretty well holds. Slavery existed in the Af sub-Saharan African environment in the eras that we're talking about in the following way. Group A conquers group B. The winner absorbs as many of the captives of the loser as it can. Uh, the women are typically married into the winning society. Their offspring become the totally assimilated and legitimate um, uh, descendants of that community. There is no taint that attaches to them from the fact of the enslavement of the, the captured parent. Uh, and in fact, there are multiple, the numerous, innumerable instances we can point to in history where the, the offspring of the enslaved within a gener, sometimes the same generation, but often within a generation or two become the chief, the king or the emperor of the, of the victorious society. When did we see that in the world of chattel slavery? Have we seen anything like that in chattel slavery? Here in the United States, People of my generation are still dealing with the taint and the penalty of slavery, right? Um, so, so I don't. Oh, think Howard, the, the, yeah, Howard, I, I think you're romanticizing here, brother. I'm sorry, but That's there okay. is still and Daniel's smiling. I, I know in Ghana and Nigeria, I, I've traveled extensively in Africa too. You know that, and there are still uh, uh, there's still prejudice against people who are descended from slaves in um, West African societies. It's like you can't marry this, you can't marry that boy because his great, great grandfather was a slave. Right, Daniel? I mean, yes. you're, you're, yes. you're presenting Even it like, not, not I wish it were, Nigeria, but it's not really that way. No, no, <laughs> you know? I told you I'm giving you a general picture. And I said, and what I'm speaking to generally is mostly about the economic arrangements. Okay, mm. uh, I also said, that the cases of people who are assimilated and then become the rulers are multiple. They're, 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 they're abundant, and that is a fact. My wife is in the next room as we speak. My wife is from Ghana. My wife, I have been in the presence of my wife and discussions about relatives of my wife who were the slaves of my wife's family. Uh, so I've seen this thing up uh, firsthand, uh, up close. And, and I know sometimes it leads to very unpleasant things, and I know that sometimes it's totally anodyne, right? But the, the point I'm making, Skip, is this has nothing to do with chattel. It's, it's, a, it's a qualitatively different thing we're talking about. And I also oh, began yeah, by I, saying- that, that part I would accept, but maybe your next book would be on the history of slavery. 
<laughs> I don't think so. It's enormously complicated. And oh, I agree with that. Audience to go away thinking uh, there might be a little pushback on that interpretation. No, and I said for I said in my the beginning of my responses, I don't I wouldn't want given a choice. I don't want to be a slave. Right under the under the best system of slavery, uh, slavery is still not generally something that I would or most people would want to aspire to, but I do think that chattel was a big innovation. And yes, I, I agree. I agree. I just don't, let us not romanticize slavery among the brothers and sisters because it just it was vicious in a different way, and it was a lifetime uh, sentence too. But anyway, um, Abby, we have another. <laughs> One last question, and this is um, <laughs> in two minutes or so. Can you bring hmm. us up to the Second World War? Of, in what's in your title, in the title of your book? Well, so yes, yeah, so the Second World War refers to the freeing of the population of the Deep South from peonage mm -hmm. and from uh, uh, essentially a kind of neo indentured servitude uh, as they were you know, bound up in very unequal Jim Crow kind of relations on the farmland of their previous slave masters uh, and their migration to throughout the country, to California, to Chicago, to you know, uh, the middle Atlantic. Um, uh, so, so that's what the Second World War refers to, that this is the, the, the third great migration. There's three great migrations in my book. The first is the Middle Passage. The second is the one I referred to when the, when the Louisiana Purchase takes place and people are marched to the Mississippi Valley. And the third one is this ending of the old um, uh, um, uh, bound kind of relationships that existed under Jim Crow and the movement of, 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 of African Americans throughout the country. You know, it just occurred to me, you could, you could do a variation on guns, germs, and steel and call it uh, sugar cotton and steel. There you go. <laughs> no, the, the, the prime drivers of those three migrations, yep. sugar, people don't understand the way, the way you put it so beautifully. Sugar was like crack for a normal person, right? When they first, imagine, remember when you had a child or you've seen a, 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 a child have the first lick of an ice cream cone in their eyes crossed? Oh, yeah. Imagine a whole culture, Western oh. civilization went nuts because yeah, all of a sudden they could have sugar and they would do it no matter what. And it, it did, uh, you know, 5 million Africans go to Brazil, 1 million go to Jamaica, 940,000 go to Cuba, 772,000 go to San Domingue, which as you said is now Haiti. And only 388,000 were shipped directly from Africa to North America and another 42,000 in the intracoastal. Why those big numbers? 600,000 landed on Barbados. Sugar, baby. <laughs> That's right. And the lifespan was from five to seven years, like a spark plug. I don't even know if cars have spark plugs anymore. They don't, but they, they just <laughs> they just replaced them, man. It, it, it was cold. It was brutal. It was ruthless and heartless. And that you're absolutely right. Uh, that's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. It is. Um, crack, you're great, Crack is man. the perfect analogy, by the way. Huh? Crack so is the perfect <laughs> analogy. If you, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, you, you, human being is not wired to be able to resist sugar. So if you've no. lived in a place, in a, in a, in a lifestyle where you had no access to sugar and no exposure to it, and suddenly you, you, you get it, you, you may as well be doing crack. Um, well, and that allowed industrialists to exploit workers in sure. Europe. They could for give sure. them sugar with their tea, right? So you have caffeine, and why do you think Britain has the whole country stops? I'm exaggerating. At four o'clock. What do you have? Caffeine and sugar, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that came from some, and there were lots of intellectuals um, who wouldn't drink sugar. I mean, that was a, I mean, wouldn't put sugar in their tea. That was a form of protest against um, against right. slavery right. in in the late 18th century and early yeah. 19th century. So, anyway, you got to come back, my brother. Uh, Anytime. This is great. Congratulations! Your book is fabulous, and uh, thank you, Daniel. So you did a superb job. Thank so, you. And, and Abby, you did too. Yeah, Abby. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Dr. Dr. Abby Wolf always is uh, superb. And Howard, please tell your wife I said hello and some ground nut soup sent up here would be a very nice thing. <laughs> You've got to come down this way for the ground nut soup, Skip. All right. You can uh, <laughs> gates at harvard.edu, baby. I'll be down there. <laughs> we'll work it out. All right. Thank All right. you. So much, Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you.